Hi everyone, Carl Steele here for English 4113, 4114, Spring 2022, talking to you today about John Hawksworth's play, Orinoco, A Tragedy, which he produced and wrote 1759, mid 18th century, about 70 years or so after the original novel. In this play, I'll just summarize the plot for you very briefly. Orinoco is sad because he believes that his beloved Imoenda is dead. So that even more perhaps than his being enslaved in some unnamed English colony is the thing that's really got his goat. But then he runs across Imoenda who is also enslaved in this same colony. And he thinks this is wonderful. Now I can be with my love. Meanwhile, one of his former men, a man named Abowen, says, well, we don't like being enslaved here. We're going to rise up in rebellion. Orinoco, being an honorable man, thinks that this would be an act of betrayal against the people who claim to own him. But eventually Abowen says, well, Imoendo is pregnant, and the child that you two have together will be born enslaved, so perhaps you don't like that. Orinoco then agrees to try to get away with everybody else who is enslaved. His plan is not to kill the white people who are enslaving them, but rather to steal the ship that brought them there to this unnamed colony. Let's call it perhaps Jamaica. However, they're betrayed by another enslaved man, and they are captured. Orinoco is promised various forms of safety, so is Imoenda. However, they are betrayed. Eventually, Imoenda escapes from the governor of this place, and she finds Orinoco. She kills herself. Orinoco is set upon, and he manages to kill the governor of the island before killing himself. Of course, the other uh, enslaved person who betrayed them is also killed in the process. So it's a tragedy. Everybody who's good and decent ends up dead, but also some of the bad people end up dead as well. And that is more or less the plot of Hawksworth's version of Orinoco. It is very different from the Afra Ben novel. Uh, first of all, of course, it's a play. And the Ben novel, which you'll be reading in the following few days, has a very strong point of view from a fictionalized version of Offer Ben herself. So there's a particular pair of eyes that you're looking out at to read this whole situation. With the play, of course, it's a bunch of actors on a stage and it does have a point of view, but you as an audience member are the person who's watching everything. So think about that as well. It's, the play is going to function differently than a novel. Uh, the earlier play that Hawksworth is building us on is by a man named Southern. That version has another plot, which is between a couple of high class white people who engage in a kind of love comedy. That was something that was very popular in the late 17th century when that particular play was written. Hawksworth thought it was in bad taste, and so he purged it of all that to make it suitable for the tastes of mid 18th century England and made it into a straight up tragedy where there are no jokes. Um, the African setting in Alfred Ben's novel is completely eliminated. So her the first half of her original novel has this great romance plot between Orinoco and his grandfather and this thing that's set in some kind of harem between Imoenda and so on. And we also get a sense of Orinoco's enormous status as a leading African leader, he's a prince, he's a man of enormous nobility and dignity. And we have a faint sense of that in the play, but nowhere near as much as we do in reading the novel. So I can ask you to think about that as well. We don't know where this is happening, really. Again, it feels like it could be Jamaica, could be Bermuda, I'm not sure. In the original, it's set in Suriname, but by the time the Hawksworth is running his play, Suriname no longer belongs to the English, it belongs to the Dutch. Uh, in the original novel, there's a, a lot of stuff having to do with Native Americans in Suriname. All of that is eliminated in the play. The natives have no lines. They are simply the enemy. They are there. They try to kim kidnap Imoenda and a bunch of the other enslaved people. And Orinoco very valiantly fights them off, being a very good 
servant basically to his white masters. Uh, it gives him a chance to show that he has this martial glory and this natural leadership. But the Native Americans, we know nothing about their customs. Uh, there's no ethnography as there is in the original novel. And perhaps most signally, in the original novel, Imoenda, Orinoco's beloved, is Black like he is. In the play, she's white. She's the daughter of a European man who's moved to West Africa, seems to have converted to the local religion. And that is the person that Orinoco is most fond of. And that man kills him, basically throws himself in between an arrow and Orinoco saves Orinoco's life and Orinoco falls in love with his white daughter. So we can talk about why Melinda becomes white in the play when she's black in the novel. So that's something we can either talk about during the novel or perhaps on Tuesday. The revolt in this version fails because Orinoco is betrayed and he's betrayed by another enslaved man. That is not the case in the original novel. It uh, fails in the original novel simply because it's very difficult to escape with children and non other non-combatants, and they're just bogged down by supply issues, which is a, kind of a theme of the last few weeks, I suppose. Uh, in this version, Imoenda kills herself. In the novel, Orinovko kills her. She allows him to do it, and it's enormously affecting. But in this version, she basically convinces Orinoco to let her kill herself. Um, he's not enormously enthusiastic about it. But in this version, Orinoco kills himself as well, but not before taking a few other people with him who are very important. Uh, in the original novel, he is captured and tortured to death. And so we can talk about why that change is also made. Um, in this version, every uh, one of the leading wicked white people is killed. So the captain who kidnapped Orinoco and brought him from Africa to this unnamed colony, he is killed in the very first <laughs> uprising. And then in the final scene, the governor, who has also betrayed both Orinoco and Imoenda, is also killed. And we can ask why it is that uh, every wicked white person, every obviously wicked white person who does individual harm to Orinoco and Imoenda is killed, and whether or not that is allowing perhaps these, this white culture to believe that evil can be done away with without destroying the entire system of slavery. So in terms of the, um, the work itself, the thing that I'm gonna ask you to think about, there's two things on this slide and the following slide. Um, I'm really struck by the opening of the play. It's very unusual, and this is not in the Southern version. This is something Hawksworth wrote himself, and it begins with a conversation between four unnamed planters. So these are the people who are raising uh, say, uh, sugar or tobacco and uh, cotton, perhaps, and they are uh, making money off this slaveocracy. And it's a conversation that's just talking about these people that they're enslaving as if they're commodities, as if they're numbers, as if they are just like pieces of farm equipment that they're frustrated with. And they're frustrated with them because they're people and because they have emotions. So one planter says, well, neighbors, Captain Driver has brought us a fresh supply, more slaves. Second one says, aye, and I'm sure we ha we've never had more need of them. The other one says, that's true indeed. I'm afraid we shall never have less. The fourth one says, yes, we'll have enough of them, I warrant you. And they come to breed. And the third one says, breed, it's a sign you're a newcomer, pox on them, a parcel of lazy, obstinate, untractable pagans. Half of them are so sulky when they first come that they won't eat their victuals when it's set before them. And a Christian may beat them until he drops down before them, before he can make them eat if they hadn't a mind to it. The second one says, beat, I faith, they may beat those that will eat long enough before they will work. What with their starving themselves and what with the discipline they require before they're put out their strength. They die as fast as rotten sheep, plague on them. The poor industrious planter loses the money they cost him and his ground runs to ruin for want of their labor. So their frustration is that they can't force these people to be obedient. They refuse to eat. They refuse to have children. They die too soon for the planters. Planters are constantly having to import more people to keep the numbers up. This is in fact a representation of the actual situation of, plant, of English planters in the Caribbean, uh, whose um, the people they enslaved died off by in enormous numbers. But it's a, it's a radically different way of understanding the characters in this play. Um, 
than we see in the actual action of the play. Ornofo and Imoenda and the other characters uh, who are enslaved are individualized in so many ways. But in this very opening, we see that they are understood primarily as a commodity and a commodity that is frustrating to the degree that they act like human beings with emotions of their own. And so I'd just like you to think about that. Why did Hawksworth begin the play in this way? And having that as a kind of framing for the play, how does that affect how we understand the remainder of the action? So if that's what you want to write about, by all means, I think that would be a very interesting topic. Or perhaps you want to write about this. Um, there's something about the genre of tragedy is this. It's really not until the 20th century, perhaps the late 19th century, that we start to see tragedy that's about normal people. But by and large, for many millennia, the, the genre of tragedy focuses on an individual person who is aristocratic, who is better than other people, who is somehow distinct from them, morally higher-minded, or committed to uh, goals or um, kind of a sense of rightness that doesn't correspond to the world around them, whether that's uh, King Lear, arguably, or Coriolanus, or Hamlet, um, that what brings them down, generally speaking, is the way they don't really fit with that world or, or their arrogance. Um, but basically you can't have tragedy without singling one person out from the crowd. And that's the person that you sort of, you, you simultaneously feel terrible, terrible about their downfall, but you also kind of feel that it's inevitable because they're so arrogant and so different from everybody else. And we really do see that a little bit in this particular tragedy with the way that Orinoco responds when he's first defeated in his uprising when he's trying to claim his liberty. So the women are clinging to the men, they all leave Orinoco, they fall upon their face, trying not for pardon. And then Orinoco says, let them all go. Now, governor, I see I own the folly of my enterprise. That is, I recognize that I did something foolish, the rashness of this action. And I must blush quite through this veil of night, a whitely shame. Incidentally, of course, the actor who's playing this role would have been doing it in dark makeup would have been played by a white man. To think that I could design to make those free who were by nature slaves, wretches, designed to be their master's dogs and lick their feet. We were too few before for victory. We're still enough to die. Not bad poetry, really. But his argument is basically that they didn't deserve liberty, that they are, because of that sort of cowardness that they showed, they are naturally suited to be slaves. This is the kind of argument that a leader in a slave culture would make. Now, Orinoco himself um, does engage in slavery back in Africa, and it is the sort of attitude that represents a princely point of view towards slavery. But it has a kind of unusual relationship or troubling relationship towards any attempt to understand this play as abolitionist, as calling for the end of slavery. Certainly some people in mid 18th century London would have received it that way. But there is a sense that the fact of Orinoco's princely bearing and his disappointment with the individuals around him maybe sits very poorly with the idea that this play is ultimately um, oriented towards an argument to end slavery. And so this is something else that you might write about. How are we supposed to understand this particular speech? Is it perhaps just a moment of Orinoco's frustration? Is it simply a character moment? Um, and therefore, under, we understand this is a kind of mark of the emotional complexity of this character? Is it a moment of, of humanizing him, of allowing us to see him in his particular individuality? Or does it have a kind of strange relationship towards the political aims of this play? Or perhaps show us that this play doesn't have the political aims that we might wish it to have? I'd just like you to think about this scene in whatever way you like. So those are the two questions for you. Again, I'm asking you to write maybe 100, 150 words, just enough for us to have something to talk about on Tuesday. And thank you for listening.